Welcome, my name is Nicola Erb and I'll be your host today from Strategic Applications International in our program called Addressing the Impacts of Methamphetamine in Rural Communities, filmed in Oklahoma today. This will be a wonderful opportunity for us to share what is happening in the world of methamphetamine with manufacturing, distribution, trafficking, drug endangered children, abuse use, treatment, and wonderful strategies that can give us hope for success. Today I'd like to welcome our featured introductory speaker, Daryl Weaver, the director of the Oklahoma Bureau of Narcotics. Thank you. What an honor to be here this morning and open this uh, tremendous uh, undertaking as we attack the rural methamphetamine problems uh, in Oklahoma. Having come from very rural Oklahoma in my raising as a young adult and as a young man, I know the limited resources that lo local law enforcement and rural law enforcement have at their disposal. Uh, they're very limited. I mean, you couple this with this insidious drug called methamphetamine, then you have the ingredients and the prescription for big, big issues in our communities. So today we're very, very excited about this video that will go out not only in Oklahoma, uh, but all over the nation that will help rural law, law enforcement in this struggle that we uh, have against methamphetamine. Uh, today's agenda is going to be very robust. It's going to be an agenda that we're going to have different components. Uh, we're, going to see, we're going to hear from intervention folks. We're going to hear from law enforcement. We're going to hear from uh, civic leaders and things of that nature and government officials. Uh, and hopefully, at the end of the day, we'll have a uh, worthwhile project that will help and for the good that we all want. I just want to thank uh, several uh, in, in organizations and folks today. I want to thank uh, the Rural Methamphetamine Law Enforcement Initiative uh, for their grant to help us in this in Oklahoma. I want to thank the Department of Mental Health, our longtime partners, and also the Crystal Darkness movement that we've had in Oklahoma uh, for several years, of which uh, I was a part of and believe in it. Uh, Crystal Darkness have been one of the first couple of individuals that were a part of that and through the weight of my agency and the State Bureau of Narcotics behind that. And what that taught us is what we must learn again today is, and that is the fact that we must have comprehensive approaches to be successful in Oklahoma. Uh, law enforcement simply cannot do it by themselves. Uh, it's, it's obviously a very important ingredient, but they cannot do it by themselves. We have to have a statewide, uh, multi-component, multi-facet operation uh, to have success against methamphetamine. So I welcome you today. Um, I'm encouraged by this today. We're starting the Monday off great in Oklahoma by the fact that we're doing this video. Thank you. Well, we do have a robust agenda for you today. We're going to start out with a Meth 101, a basic overview on the trends, the way that it's manufactured, some of the aspects about methamphetamine given to you by a regional expert. We're also then going to have a panel called Rural Voices to have a little impact from those who come from the rural communities on what they're seeing and what some of the challenges may be. Our next panel will be community impacts. One piece that we have really learned about methamphetamine is this drug has an ability to impact a community from the leaders down to the children in the play yards. It seems to span all of a community and there takes, therefore takes a holistic approach at strategies for success. Our next panel that we will have, which will feature some of the programs and strategies that folks have used to combat this problem. And our last session will be some of the resources that are out there that are available. I will be able to provide you with some of the federal, state, and local resources that you can reach out for for your own assistance. Thank you. I'd like to introduce Dub Turner from CopNet, and he will be providing your uh, Meth 101 training uh, program. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. There are three, basically three types of methamphetamine uh, we find in the state of Oklahoma. L-methamphetamine and DL-methamphetamine, which is produced by the old P2P or fetal tube propanone method. The other is D-methamphetamine, which is produced by the ephedrine or pseudoephedrine reduction method. Uh, first, we will talk about the red phosphorus method. <coughs> Excuse me. The uh, red phosphorus method basically is a four-step process, and we'll get there in just a minute. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Most of the pseudoephedrine that you see or you buy at the store, the majority of that is starches and binders. 
So to do a red P method, you have to separate the starches and binders from the pseudoephedrine. And that is a process that is very easily done. You grind the tablets up, mix them with a solvent. Let the solvent set for a while. The pseudoephedrine is absorbed up into the solvent and layers that on the top. <clears throat> you can pour the waste product off <clears throat> through a coffee filter into another container and then allow the liquid substance to dry. You can add heat to it to speed that process up. Once you have your powder, powder pseudoephedrine, pure pseudoephedrine, you can go to step two <clears throat> where you mix the pseudoephedrine, red phosphorus, iodine crystals, and water together. It produces an exothermic reaction approximately 375 degrees. Add a little heat to that, cook that for an hour, to th or basically from an hour and a half to three hours, and <clears throat> you produce a very dark red liquid substance. Uh, after that is done, you will take that and pour it through another coffee filter. Uh, the red phosphorus pseudoephedrine and iodine crystals that are not used is captured. They will reuse that later. The liquid is then mixed with uh, red devil lye to reduce the acidity of it. After that is done, <clears throat> you will add ice while you're adding the sodium hydroxide or red devil lye. I add ice to that because, again, it promotes a exothermic reaction. It gets very hot. So that ice in there will keep the reaction cool. Uh, once you have done that, <clears throat> you will again mix that with a solvent. Let it separate out. The methamphetamine base is drawn up into the solvent and it layers out. Your top layer, again, will be your methamphetamine base. Once you have produced your methamphetamine base, you will pour it off into another container. Pour it through a coffee filter. Then the fourth step of this is what's called the HCl, or hydrogen chloride gas step. <clears throat> you mix sulfuric acid and salt together, and again, it produces a, hyd a uh, uh, exothermic reaction. That reaction also produces a gas, which is hydrogen chloride gas. You can do it with salt uh, and sulfuric acid, livestock block salt, table salt, ice cream salt, anything that has a salt base to it you can use. Or you can use tinfoil and muriatic acid to produce hydrogen chloride gas. Once you mix those two things together, <clears throat> the HCl gas is produced and you put the end of the bubbler hose, what they call it, into the meth base. Once that meth base and the hydrogen chloride gas come together, it starts forming a powder, which is methamphetamine hydrochloride. Once that bubbling takes place, <clears throat> the liquid or the wet, moist methamphetamine base will be in the bottom of your container. Pour it through a coffee filter. You capture that methamphetamine base. <clears throat> lay it out, let it dry. Uh, if you want to make it nice and pretty and white, you can mix it with ether or another type of solvent to make it white and pretty. Uh, then you lay it out, let it dry, and add your cut to it if you're going to cut it. And then package it and it's ready for sale. That's basically the red pea method. Uh, <clears throat> the next method we'll talk about is called the Nazi method. And it is a complete different method, and it takes about a half the time that it does the red P method. The Nazi method is, is still another three-step method. When these slides were produced, uh, at the time the people felt that you liked the red P method, you had to separate the pseudoephedrine from the starches and binders in the tablets. Uh, later cooks have found out they don't have to do that. Now basically all you do is grind up the tablets, put it in a reaction flask or a plastic bucket, uh, anything that can handle the cold. And <clears throat> you grind your tablets up, put it in there, you put either lithium or sodium metal uh, in there. That you, uh, sodium or lithium metal comes from lithium batteries you can buy at the store. You peel the batteries apart, pull the lithium strips out of it, drop it in your container. Then you add the anhydrous ammonia to it while you stir it a little bit. Uh, the mixture will turn a deep blue, a dark royal blue color, 
and then as it, the anhydrous ammonia evaporates off of it, it'll turn back to a white powder, white color. After that occurs, you have to, <clears throat> excuse me, you have to quench the reaction for a short time with water. After that is done, <clears throat> again, you mix it with a solvent. After you mix it with a solvent, <clears throat> again, you will add the hydrogen chloride gas to it. That turns it from a meth base back to methamphetamine hydrochloride. So, <clears throat> again, you produce your hydrogen chloride gas. You bubble the hydrogen chloride gas through the methamphetamine base, and again, you lay it out and let it dry. The one-pot method that they're talking about, the new method, the one-pot method, is just a splinter off of the Nazi method. It uses some of the same products. Uh, instead of anhydrous ammonia, you're using ammonia nitrate. You mix the ammonia nitrate, pseudoephedrine, lithium metal, along with ether and a small amount of water into a container. You start add, adding sodium hydroxide or red devil eye to that. It creates an exothermic reaction, starts at boiling. <clears throat> when the lithium metal inside that container comes in contact with water, there is a, a um, I call it a controlled explosion. Uh, there's a reaction that takes place around 600 and something degrees inside there. You'll see a flash. And <clears throat> basically what that is doing is driving an oxygen and a hydrogen molecule off the ephedrine or pseudoephedrine and turns it into methamphetamine. So thank you um, for showing us a little bit of the trends that you're seeing in Oklahoma. Do you still feel like methamphetamine is a predominant problem in the state? It's one of, the, one of our major problems right now uh, within our state and, and a lot of other states. All right, and you and I discussed prior, but it isn't always easy to track that, is it? Can you explain a little bit about why we have a lack of data for in many of our states? Well, <clears throat> a lot of it depends on the reporting. Uh, there's nothing in the state right now that tracks the number of people that are arrested for methamphetamine crimes. Um, it's kind of grouped up into a controlled dangerous substance or uh, synthetic narcotic or something like that is there's no real reporting system. Yeah, we, we all could use a little bit of work on how we report things so that we can better serve our communities. Correct. So to the best of your knowledge, do you think that most of the methamphetamine in Oklahoma is produced in the state and some of the methodology that you showed or coming from other states or perhaps other countries such as Mexico? It, it's predominantly, I would say, probably 85 to 90 percent of the methamphetamine that comes to Oklahoma comes via Mexico. Uh, the rest of it is, is kind of homemade. Okay. And your labs have an ability to kind of test that or through narcotics major investigations sort of track that possibly it yes. came from Mexico. Yes. Wonderful. So you've been in the field for a while. And what advice would you give to community members who have children um, how to avoid these issues, have, getting involved with methamphetamine, manufacturing, trafficking, use at all for their kids? I would tell parents you have to be nosy. Uh, be involved with your children. Know who their friends are. Uh, you know, if you have to, you know, violate their rights, I guess, if they haven't in your home. Be nosy. Go into the room. See what's there. Keep track of them. Be involved in their lives. Uh, with our mobile busy society today, parents forget that. And if they don't stay in touch with their children and their lives, and they don't educate them, uh, then, you know, that's when they lose track of their kids. So they need to be involved with those children. Get involved and be educated yourself. Wonderful. Correct. And what are some of the signs or clues or symptoms that somebody can see in another that might be starting to use methamphetamine, whether it's a friend or we see a lot of issues with workplace use or even children? What are some of those signs yeah. and symptoms? <clears throat> they need to watch uh, the majority of time uh, people starting to use methamphetamine. Number one, they will start losing a lot of weight. Uh, the circle of friends they had before changes. Uh, they won't bring the new friends around. 
Uh, they develop uh, formification or what they call meth bugs, uh, open sores uh, that cover their bodies. Uh, methamphetamine attacks the calcium in your system, so they have a lot of teeth problems. We call it meth mouth. Their teeth start rotting and falling out. Uh, and they can go days without sleeping. Uh, personal hygiene, uh, taking care of families, really the cravings that methamphetamine causes can override the five human basic instincts of survival. So that becomes number one in their life. But really, it's just that's very subtle at first. Uh, normally the weight loss, uh, new friends, uh, being gone for a long time, uh, that's kind of the things you watch for at first. Wonderful. So it comes back to what you said before, you have to pay attention. Right. You have to pay attention for the people to the people in your lives and the people that work for you and your children yeah. in order to even notice those yeah. things. You have to educate yourself. Well, how come do you think anyone would even start using meth, particularly the last 10 years we've had many publications, a lot of media exposure, people see it in their communities. Why do we still see this as an epidemic, particularly in rural communities? I think it's kind of a building process. I think it starts very basic, <coughs> um, kind of with alcohol. Just as an example, uh, people go to a party, they drink, you know, they get real lax, they enjoy their self, they are more susceptible to suggestion or peer pressure at that time. So it's, you know, here, try a little marijuana. And they do that, it's fun, you know, they feel good. Next thing you know, try a little meth. And it just kind of works its way into the, into the party scene. And, uh, you know, Nobody wants peer pressure, you know, so they have to learn to control that and deal with that and, and basically say, no, get away from it. Uh, <clears throat> those that don't, uh, I've talked to meth addicts for years, and they always say the first thing, I, I thought I could control it. And normally when they say, I can control it, they've already lost. It's already controlling them. So that's a good message to get out there is you don't know what you don't know, and you may think you can control it, you can't. I still think you brought up a good issue about this is one of those drugs that people build on. I think a lot of people wake up one day and start using meth. We need to pay attention when people are abusing other substances, marijuana, alcohol, and some of those which are traditionally called gateway drugs.